American classical music has its roots in European humanism, when sacred music broke away from the church early in the 15th century. Historians call this age, from 1420 to 1600, the Renaissance, meaning rebirth. It was a period of great cultural awakening and of flowering the arts, letters, and sciences. The Dark Ages were over. New voices appeared in music, led by the Flemish master Josquin de Pré, who composed secular songs and madrigals right along with his sacred masses and motets. A new style called polyphony took shape, and it created exciting musical thrills as separate melodies imitated each other when they entered the musical fabric at large. Martin Luther was fond of the music of Josquin and others in the Flemish school of composers. By the end of the 1600s, two generations after Josquin, another composer, Orlando de Lasso, had written 2,000 masses, madrigals, motets, German leader, and French chansons, all in the new polyphonic texture, and many of the works were for non-religious social occasions. At the same time, Giovanni Pierluigi, called by the place of his birth, Palestrina, devoted himself almost completely to religious music. He turned out masses and motets of such beauty, spiritual depth, and technical refinement that they are still studied and performed to this day. Meanwhile, English composers William Byrd, John Dowlin, Thomas Morley, and several others composed a variety of madrigals, dance music, and assorted incidental pieces for social entertainment. Named after the popular ornate style of architecture from 1600 to 1750, the Baroque period expressed in music the new reality of the day as British, French, and Dutch colonial governments took control of vast regions of the world, massive cathedrals stretched to the heavens. The steam engine would soon unleash awesome power. It was an age of explosive expansion, or reaching out, and it was all done in a colorful and theatrical manner. The major European monarchies tried to outdo each other in pride, pomp, and pageantry. Many monarchs hired composers at their courts, treating the composers as servants. Churches, too, employed composers, instrumentalists, painters, sculptors, and architects to bring emotion and beauty to the religious experience. Euro-American classical music as we know it today took shape and substance during the Baroque period. The innovator who opened the door was Claudio Monteverde. His 1607 opera, Orfeo, reveal the potential of music and drama to coalesce into one of the high art forms of Western civilization.
Surely the most important composer of the era was Johann Sebastian Bach. Writing in every form and style except opera, Bach brought the Baroque aesthetic to its highest excellence. He wrote choral preludes, inventions, fantasies, fugues, suites, toccatas, concertos, orchestral suites, cantatas, and oratorios for voices, keyboards, and orchestral instruments. The Brandenburg Concertos and St. Matthew Passion are among his most popular works. George Frederick Handel stands right next to Bach in prestige and respect. While Bach was a loner, almost antisocial, Handel was a man of the world, at home with kings and nobility. Handel composed an abundance of concerto grosso works, solo concertos, harpsichord music, operas, and incidental pieces. He is best remembered for his famous Messiah, and also water music, several oratorios, and especially the Royal Fireworks Music. The Italians also distinguished themselves during the Baroque period, especially Giuseppe Torelli, Arcangelo Corelli, and Antonio Vivaldi, and the violin makers Antonio Stradivari, Niccolo Amati, and Giuseppe Guarneri. They constructed the best violins ever made. Their violins, violas, and cellos are worth millions of dollars even today, 250 years later. Approaching the middle of the 18th century, composers began to move away from the heavily ornamented style of the Baroque era, and after a brief Rococo period with its overabundance of merely decorative musical gestures, the classical period, 1750 to 1820, arrives, and we enter one of the great epochs in music history. The pendulum swings from the passions of the Baroque to the intellectual control and enlightenment of this age of reason. Franz Joseph Haydn set the model for the classical period. He wrote 20 operas, 70 string quartets, 60 keyboard sonatas, 108 symphonies, 200 chamber works, and dozens of cantatas, concertos, and oratorios. He was called Papa Haydn. He established patterns and forms of classical music that were guidelines for the next 50 years. At age six, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart dazzled all of Europe with feats of memory and keyboard skills. By age 12, he had written 10 symphonies and two operas, one in German, the other in Italian. He died at age 35, but composed over 600 symphonies, string quartets, operas, concertos, sonatas, masses, quintets, and miscellaneous works.
a giant among giants, Ludwig van Beethoven, stood boldly with one foot in the classical period and one foot in the romantic period. His music has all the designs of classicism, control, balance, linear order and such. But at every turn, he pops the buttons off the classical garment with his ferocious emotional energies. His 16 string quartets, nine symphonies, and a wealth of sonatas, concertos, and chamber works stand unexcelled in the literature. From 1820 to 1900, composers and performers of classical music reached out to the wealthy business upper classes created by the Industrial Revolution. Historians called this new age the Romantic Era, drawing inspiration from the ancient poems of heroes and chivalry, of distant lands and faraway places, in other words, recreating the romances of medieval times. Wolfgang Goethe dismissed this age of reason and said, my heart has reason of its own. Delacroix painted liberty leading the people with bold colors and dramatic gestures. The arts turned away from the delicate nuances of symmetry, balance, and refinement. The new order of the day was a passion for wonder, mystery, ecstasy, emotional subjectivity, atmosphere, mood, and abandon. The earliest romantic composers were all born around the turn into the 19th century. The Germans, Franz Schubert, Felix Mendelssohn, Robert Schumann, the Polish poet of the piano, Frédéric Chopin, and the French genius Hector Berlioz. These greats were followed by the flamboyant pianist Franz Liszt and the audacious Richard Wagner, composer of six-hour operas. But the most popular of the Romantic composers was Peter Tchaikovsky. He has his own greatest hits in nearly every category of music. Consider these offerings.
The last of the great romantics was Richard Strauss, who proved well into the 20th century that there were still powerful works to be composed in the vocabulary, grammar, and syntax of the romantic sensibilities. Meanwhile, America was extending its love of classical music with a first concert on December 7, 1842 of an orchestra that became the New York Philharmonic. And by the end of the 1800s, there were major symphony orchestras also in Chicago, Boston, St. Louis, and Cincinnati. In 1880, John Philip Seuss's appointment to lead the United States Marine Band inspired high schools and colleges to new levels of wind band performances. The Metropolitan Opera House was completed in 1883. The Library of Congress established a music division. All the universities would soon establish music departments for the serious study of classical music. America was well on its way to full participation in the world of classical music. The Romantic Age came to a close with what most scholars call nationalism. Each European country seemed compelled to promote its own particular musical gifts. The Russians, Czechs, Hungarians, Spaniards, Scandinavians, and French composed with pride the kind of romantic music that seemed to capture the emotional core of their unique musical heritage. The French treatment of this urge was called Impressionism, drawing on the artworks of the French Impressionist painters and the Symbolist poets. Musically, the Impressionists carried the Romantic aesthetic to its logical conclusion. No calculated form, no rigid gestures, just pure emotions and sensations from the music. Shimmering pools of sounds, diaphanous cascades of delicate notes, non-developmental patterns of colors and impressions. The early 20th century opened with the first of many controversial works by Igor Stravinsky. In 1913, at age 31, Stravinsky stunned the world with a score for the ballet called the Rite of Spring. It caused a major riot in Paris. Sophisticated ballet fans shouted at each other and even hit each other with their umbrellas. Stravinsky had to sneak out the backstage exit to escape injury. Arnold Scharnberg was equally controversial. He developed a 12-tone school of composing, where every note is equal in its tension and absence of tension. Even today, 100 years later, his works caused difficulties in the concert hall. While Scharnberg and Stravinsky swam out into strange waters, Aaron Copland, Howard Hansen, Roy Harris, Leonard Bernstein, and dozens of others continued to compose in traditional patterns of melody and harmony to the huge satisfaction of concert audiences all over the world. From 1950 to the present day, often called the contemporary period or simply postmodernism, composers have been free to be completely independent. There is no specific classic or romantic school. All options are available in any given concert experience. John Cage ignored all traditions in his work. Imaginary Landscape Number 4 calls for 12 radios and 24 musicians selecting different stations on those radios. A conductor throws dice to determine which of the 12 radio teams gets a signal to change stations. The result is, therefore, completely chance each time the work is presented. Thank you. 
A curious return to traditional melodies and harmonies has been around now since the 1960s. It's called minimalism, and it consists of short fragments, simple chords, and conservative rhythmic patterns delivered in relentless, almost hypnotic repetition. Steve Reich and John Adams have written minimalist works with much success. One of the most famous works in this style is the 1971 opera Einstein on the Beach by Philip Glass and Robert Wilson. On stage are 15 squares with people in them doing different things. It's set up like the television show Hollywood Squares, with 15 different guests in 15 different cubicles. During the three and one half hours of the opera, Einstein sits visible to the audience in a straight back chair at the extreme right edge of the stage, playing his violin in no specified manner during the entire length of the show. The score calls for a soprano saxophone, electric organ, flute, bass, clarinet, alto saxophone, and one or two additional electronic keyboards. On stage are various soloists, dancers, small groups of vocalists, and four actors. Where does classical music go from here? It's only a guess, but one thing seems likely. Future composers of classical music will use the revolution in communication systems, the internet, iPods, cell phones and such, to tell their story in new and exciting ways.